Welcome to the very first four wheel drive action live RC experts. We're here at Berrima Diesel with diesel guru Andrew Lemroth. Mate, thank you very much for having us. Brendan, welcome, mate. Always a pleasure to be down here. Now, uh, what we're going to be doing over the next half an hour is we're going to be answering, or rather, Andrew's going to be answering, I'm just going to be playing along, your diesel questions. Now, you can actually play along at home. You can put live questions up on Facebook. I'm going to use this I clock pad thing that I've only just sort of figured out how, how to use. Um, I'm going to try and read your questions as we go. So put up questions, whether it's about diesel maintenance, modifications, problems, uh, whatever it is, if you, want a, if you want a question answered, if you want a genuine question answered that you can genuinely trust the answer, this is the place to do it. So let's kick it off. Um, first off, we've got Aiden. So Andrew, Aiden writes, I've got a factory turbo 80 series. It's got a freshly rebuilt engine and a brand new turbo. Lucky bugger, right? Eh? Uh, but recently I've found there's a little bit of oil in the turbo. I've been, told it's a, I've been told it's a usual problem in the 1HDT engine. Is it a major problem? And even if it isn't, what can be done to fix it? Look, I think that's a pretty good question because so often turbos are rebuilt and engines are rebuilt not knowing what's going on. So the oil that you'd be experiencing guaranteed would be from the oil breather pipe. So you've probably heard of all the, um, the latest, everybody's gone crazy with catch cans. So if we sort of look at it, we've got the oil breather pipe coming out of the rocket cover, breathes yeah. fumes, they go down to the suction side. Now when it's got a turbo, that's before the turbo, because you've got boost after the turbo. So everything from that point, usually it's near the air cleaner somewhere that pipe comes in, oily fumes go in with the incoming air, and of course then through the turbo and maybe intercooler or wherever, down into the engine. So if you pull off some piping when you're doing some work, you actually will end up finding, gee, there's oil in there. So many times we've had people come in, um, maybe to get their turbo checked or told us the story, how do I prevent it happening again? I've had the turbo rebuilt because of this. Shouldn't have even been rebuilt. It's actually sort of there, part of that whole sequence of oil fumes, etc. So yeah, a catch can, we get rid of that. But at the end of the day, it's quite safe. If it's a non-EGR uh, non vehicle, being an older vehicle like the 80, they don't have an EGR, no problems with those oil fumes going in. So just, that's what it would be. So just naturally part and parcel of that motor's operation. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, that's I'm guessing that's a bit of relief for Aiden there. Yeah. Look, again, it's you know, it's I guess something that we see. You know, guys really panic. They see mm. oil somewhere, and it usually is a panic. Yeah. But it's quite normal to see it in there. Loads of oil is not. Mm. I had a guy actually on the phone coincidentally only the other day ring up about a similar sort of thing. And uh, like I said, to him, forget looking after the turbo, check your pipe before the turbo where that oil fumes pipe's connected. Sure enough, he rang back and he said, oh, that was oily too. I said, well, that's where it's coming from. Fair enough. Well, there you go, Aiden. There's your question answered, mate. So let's move on to the next one. And um, this is an absolute doozy. I reckon you're gonna have a very strong opinion on this. Um, <laughs> Damien writes, G'day, Forder of Action and Andrew. I've got a 2016 diesel Hilux SR5. My dealers advise me against fitting a catch can to the Lux. I'm skeptical about not doing this mod, but don't want to avoid any warranties the car's only six months old. What's your advice? Now that's a that's a curly one because obviously, you know, blokes like Damien out there, they've spent a lot of money to go and buy a beautiful new four wheel drive. The last thing you want to do is void that warranty. Yeah, look, I think it's a we could really talk about this for hours, let yeah. me tell you. It's a big part of what we've been doing of you know, of, of the last recent years now, really catch cans. It's all to do with EGR, EGR operation and keeping the inlet dry so that EGR can work. So I think what we would normally do with our vehicles by wanting to look after them, sure the dealer um, puts up the hackles and they say no, but in the end we're trying to protect our vehicle out of warranty, it probably won't play up in warranty, even without a catch can or any of that stuff. But fitting some of those things, using the right oils, changing them probably a bit more regularly than some of these 15 and mm. 20,000 gauge. It's all to prevent things, make it last much longer later when you're well out of warranty and you're going to foot the bill if something goes wrong. It is a grey uh, matter area or you know, a real grey area because the dealer can point fingers at anything. But I guess at the end of the day, the catch can is catching those oily fumes, stopping your inlet from choking up with the EGR carbons, which are trying to do their job, but when the two are combined, creates a problem. Um, I would really challenge it being sort of inert in the equation, meaning it's not like a performance mod or an exhaust or anything else that might have some lay-on effect with power, etc. This is pulling out those oily fumes, which are virtually waste product, mm. instead of it regurgitating and bringing it back through the inlet again. Mm. So, look, it's really up to the customer in the end. We say just fit it, 
save yourself the long-term damage and protect your engine and challenge it with the dealer. Probably mm. don't even ask the dealer. Just get it in for service and go. Mm. We get a lot of people ring up. We're very happy to talk to people and probably not read them the right act, but give them the right act they can read to the dealer when they start doing these things. Because when they say some of these comments, probably from a legal point of view, it's um, you know third party forcing, whatever the legal eagles want to call it, it really is trying to captivate and control the audience in Australia. That's downright illegal. Mm. They know the games they're playing, but it's a game of bluff. Mm. You then end up getting there going, oh, I've got my $70,000 vehicle. They've said now no warranty at all. Mm. So it's a hard one, but I really say a lot of that is to protect your long-term investment. Mm. It makes a lot of sense. Have you ever heard any first-hand accounts of um, warranties being knocked back? Um, look, I guess our number one area that we, you know, lay around with warranty would be say with our DP chip products, sure. performance tuning an engine. And we've had certainly over the years we've been doing you know electronic tuning for 20 years. Mm. We've certainly had a good fair share of you know dealers pointing fingers and that sort of stuff. We've got a pretty good um, routine of giving information to the customer, getting him to bear pressure on the dealer and all sorts of things. Something very inert that's a performance product. Mm. Inert and not doing a lot of stuff like a catch can. Yeah other than taking the oil out, I think it would be very easy to deflect mm. and probably bend the dealer's arm into just saying, get on and service my vehicle, yeah. you know, ignore what you're seeing. Unless that becomes a problem, then let's worry about it. And then if you've really got a problem, always feel free to at least give us a call because we're pretty skilled in playing that game of um, poker, and that's really what it is. It they're is. looking at the screen going, uh, you know, we've seen no problems before, but they say, hey, we've seen a lot of problems with you when they're avoiding the warranty. Mm. And you're there going, oh, I've got no cards in my hand. So play the aces back, even if you've only got spades, mm. and there's a good chance that um, it'll just calm down. So generally, we don't really hear any problems with things like the filters and catch cans and stuff. Mm. But a lot of people are worried about it, that's for yeah. sure, doing any models. For sure. And I guess uh, you mentioned it a moment ago, um, I guess consumer law in Australia is pretty much slandered to protect the consumer. It's, it, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of horror stories out there, of course, but um, I think the consumer law is, uh, from, from it, talking to blokes, I'm sure you've heard it too, um, it's set up to um, put the onus on on uh, the little bloke not being screwed over by the big company, I guess. It, it is, actually, that's the end of the day. If you in New South Wales went to a consumer claims tribunal hearing, well, there's no longer a motor vehicle repair industry council mm. in this state, so you just go to consumer affairs. So you could have anybody presiding over that case. but. When you do go there, there is a good chance just by the fact that you've gotten that far, it'll be probably no worse than at least 50-50, you know, mm -hmm. your way and the dealer, mm -hmm. or maybe even slanting 100% your way, anywhere in between. <laughs> because if they're using the uh, blame and the scare tactics with no fact or anything mm -hmm. behind it, then obviously when somebody that does need to see fact comes up there, it would be pretty hard for them to prove that they don't need to honour their warranty. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Now, this is one that I reckon you'll definitely have a strong opinion on because we've talked about it before. Now, Shane Howard writes, what will reduce EGTs more, an intercooler upgrade or an exhaust upgrade? Now, I know that you've got a uh, three-litre common rail patrol over there and you've done a lot of touring in it. We've spoken at length before about your experiences with particularly the EG, um, EGTs in that. Mm. So what, so what, an intercooler upgrade or an exhaust, what, what do you reckon? Look, I think at the end of the day, that's right, getting cool air in. So the exhaust contains the heat and, you know, restrictive, like our patrol, they've got two catalytic converters mm. in the series. And obviously, you know, that's a, a, whether it's a restriction or not, it's obviously an area that gets hot and keeps heat up in that front area. Mm. Big exhaust can get rid of it, but measuring it right at the back of the turbo, you'll probably find there's negligible to no difference. Unless somehow like an older, 80 series or something you put on a big exhaust that naturally frees the boost up mm. well if an egt comes down well the boost might have naturally come up but something like our patrol where they're quite electronically controlled boost and all bigger exhaust negligible difference in egt mm. but you know it's getting rid of it quicker mm. intercooler is the thing that'll make the difference so if you really are looking at trying to weigh down and pull down those egts you do need to get cool air in you know you've got boost running in the vicinity of the high teens now with nearly every mm. turbo diesel on the market, up to even over 20 odd pounds, mm. towards 30 even in some diesels. And of course that generates a lot of heat. So a decent intercooler will have a good impact on those EGTs. It, it probably, the intercooler even coupled with sometimes increasing boost in high performance diesels like ours. Mm -hmm. We've put our DP chip X on, got a lot of fuel going in there. Mm. We've brought the boost up, we're yet to chuck on the G turbo so we can go even higher. 
obviously more air again will help cool down that mm. fire. But the intercoolers obviously are an area that you will certainly make some guaranteed headway in. But it's got to be a serious size. Sure. Going from that little patrol one to just something a bit bigger, negligible difference. We've got the big sort of, you know, double core cross country. It's double the width, maybe two and a half times wider. Mm. And the fan on there. And that's started to chew into probably, you know, realistically, might have only been 50 or 80 degrees EGT, but that's a lot. And I could say it's a lot more than that. But after you let it stabilise in temperature to get a real true reading, worst case, that's still quite a lot. If you can knock 50 or 80 degrees it's out, huge, yeah. that's huge. It is, absolutely. Righto, so let's move on to the next question. Um, okay, so Paul Baldry writes, what should I clean my ProVent filter out with? So ProVent obviously being oil yeah. catch can, oil fumes catch can. We'll reach around, we've got a couple of them sitting here. <coughs> so we rip the top off the, the ProVent and we pop out the... Thing. I guess let me just go back to the basics. Sure. Probably technically, they're actually an oil separator. Sure. So people are an oil fume separator. And a lot of people, you know, call them, we call them catch cans and fumes filters and all sorts of other things, but they really are separating the oil. Obviously, these have got a synthetic material in here that um, I guess a bit like a pillow, you know, sort of swapped in here. And you've now got the fumes coming in through the middle in this particular, uh, that's a ProVent 200 through the middle and they sort of permeate through and as they do permeate the oil gets joined further and it gets heavy goes down the bottom and it falls into the bottom of the catch can mm. so at the end of the day you're really not trapping you're getting distilled fumes which obviously don't have a lot of heavy contaminant it's very fine it's more than likely not going to block this up in a hurry man hummel at Provence say about every 40 to 50 thousand cases to throw it in the bin mm. Probably not a bad idea. It's about every hundreds of big service, so every 50 throw it in the rubbish bin. Does it really need cleaning? Probably debatable. You've got a pressure relief valve in the lid. So if we put this on, pressure relief valve is very, very sensitive. If somehow it was getting blocked, mm. you'd get oil all around the top of it there. And we've seen a lot of them with quite a bit of mileage on now. Looks heavily coated, but again, it's only oil going through it. It's not filtering out the carbon. It's not filtering out dust mm. like an air filter. Mm -hmm. Really, it's just filtering the oil out. And the oil particles of carbon in there are so tiny, they won't really block that up. So I think preventative maintenance, 40 to 50,000, throw it in the bin. Uh, you could clean it, maybe with a hydrocarbon like brake clean or something. Yep. Uh, whether that's good for it, I can't mm. really say. I'll probably have a chat with uh, Rainer at Manhummel and find out. But at the end of the day, it's more like pull it out throw it in the rubbish mm. bin as a preventative measure. Yeah, yeah, and like, there's no point risking an engine for something as simple as a filter, is there? That's what it comes down to in the end. If we look at our big trips, you know, you do a Kimberley trip and you mm. look at all the food preparation mm. costs, you know, damage to the vehicle, you know, all those things, $50 yeah. filter. It's a no-brainer. $40 fuel filter, yeah. all those things are no-brainers. Absolutely. Okay, very good. So this next one's been emailed in. This is from Matt. He says, I'm looking at a 2009 Prado. It's got 150,000 kilometres on the clock. The D4D motor. Now, the D4D motors, they've obviously um, talked quite, there's a lot, of the, a lot of talk about the injector issues. How do I know, uh, not being technically right, um, what condition the injectors are in? Is there a way, can you listen for them? Mm, well, we've got those famous mm. Toyota injectors sitting here. Um, look, I guess at the end of the day, you can uh, check values electronically on the injectors. Okay. Sometimes I sort of wonder, I mean, it's the, you know, the, the criminal telling the achieve what's good and bad. I mean, you know, the computer's looking at that stuff and those values, sometimes we've seen them where the values are actually quite acceptable, mm. very acceptable. And when it's cold in the morning, we're in the Highlands here, it's freezing already tonight, yeah. it's going to get colder this winter. Cold, you know, cold start and out the driveway and up the road and you'll hear that absolute uh, injector rattling. Mm. It's a real, tick, 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 tick. it's a real, like a bit of a stuck injector, yep. but the values were nearly perfect. Mm. So I really question whether the injector values are that accurate or relevant. Um, certainly when it's cold, that's a real time you can really pick them. The needle's a bit extra jab yeah, yeah. grabby and, and it only needs to just hang up and allow microseconds, a tiny amount more fuel in mm. that's not needed and it's too much and it's noisy. So, you know, I think really the noise, not to say wait for the noise and there's a big bang, mm. but if it really starts sounding, gee, this diesel's quite noisy when it's cold, yeah. quite pronounced, do something about it. Sure. Well, you're a kid. By the time you get your the mechanic's ear on it, and he has a listen like we hear them here, mm. just driving it around and it's warm, we can even just hear it in the background. 
time to do mm. something about it very, very soon. Sure, and I guess that's a, a, a classic example of why you should always look at a vehicle cold, never, if you're going to go and buy it, never ever, <laughs> the dodgy cells always warm it up and make sure it's running nicely, but you always want to make sure that it's cold when you I think that's absolutely yeah. a must. I mean, it's so often, you know, you will get there and yeah. there's no cold starting issue because it might have, you know, been started only an hour ago. Yeah. It's still warmish, yeah. those things. Get it cold. We're a long way from anybody. All our customer base is way out of area. But a lot of people stay at the motel or the campground overnight because we need problems overnight. That's mm. when you can sometimes pick things mm -hmm. much better than once they're sort of warmed up and fluid and running. Sure, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What sort of um, what sort of service intervals do you reckon are a safe sort of bet for a or the motor in a highlight? Yeah, look, I guess at the end of the day, you know, 10,000 Ks is pretty much a norm. Mm. I have this sort of standard when it comes to that stuff now. Um, the diesel lovers, if they really can't help themselves, mm. Still the old 5,000, yeah. they're probably changing out clean oil virtually. Yeah, yeah. 10,000 with cleaner running diesels than years ago mm. seems to be the norm. These 15s and 20s, yeah. our Mercedes Vito van, you reset it and it comes up 22, 24,000. Mm. Wow. Too long. But we've brought this up many, many times before on Facebook. I actually had a guy with a Mercedes van say, I've got 200,000, trouble three, Mercedes Benz book servicing mm. only. That's fine. But these old clunkers, we're turboing yeah. at half a million kilometres. Yep. So it might be still good at 200. Mm. Will it be good at that high mileage or will it still be going? And it's got to be good for the earth. Mm. We're not rebuilding and throwing things in the rubbish bin. So Absolutely. I still say they lasted a long time for a reason. The guys are changing the oil regularly. Mm. But probably on average for most of the new common rail diesels, about every 10,000. Okay. okay. Um, Dane here writes, fuel filters, how often should you, should you be changing them? Yeah, so a fuel filter, again, is that bit of a no-brainer, preventative maintenance sort of thing. And it, it, we've sort of posted those pictures and videos up well before. With a lot of the vehicles now, um, particularly the later model common rail ones, you've got a fuel filter cartridge. You probably see a, a uh, heap of them over here. You know, we've cut, cut ones open, you know, nice clean one, the real dirty one. When you're changing them, you can see what's going on. Mm. So if you've got a, a Hilux or a... BT50 or a Ford Ranger or those popular vehicles, the V8 cruisers that have the cartridge filters, get it changed, get it done about every 10,000 Ks and take a little ice cream bucket and say, mate, can you put it in there just mm. so I can see? Take a bit of it into your own hands and then you can also see what your fuel's doing. Mm. When it comes down to maybe the spin-on type filters, a bit harder unless mm. we cut them all open mm. and that's a big job really. Mm. So the preventative maintenance, I say, in a perfect world is every 10. Mm. Probably every 20 you know, is really a maximum mm. because that's a lot of fuel and a lot of tank fuels in that time period and a lot of different supplies, particularly on a trip. Yeah, so yes. you know, the more you can keep that window of opportunity down to a small time period, mm. the better. And it might be a little bit overkill, but I think in dividends in the end, it pays off. Mm. You know, ones that have regularly changed filters and stuff, We've got Hilux Pridos with those injector issues mm. that have got quite high mileage on yeah. not playing up. But the guy's very religious with all his servicing and overdoes filter changes and that. Could it play a part of it? Probably it could mm. be playing a part. Also be very, very careful with, we've shown it before, crappy aftermarket filters. Sure. There's one good genuine, there might be a good uh, replacement or two. Yep. But nowadays compared to 30 years ago when mm. there might have been one or two crappy ones, there's 10 crappy mm. ones or more. So how do you pick that through the minefield? That's the <laughs> problem. So as a simplest solution there, stick to genuine most of the time? I think, look, nowadays, particularly with fuel filters, when you're looking at very expensive injection mm. systems, commonly here, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 plus mm. to do big repairs in common rail, you can't go wrong with a lot of the genuine. I think I've even recommended when we found some problems with one of the uh, genuine Mazda filters in the VT50s, it's a Danzo filter. Go to get a Toyota one even, you know? Mm. Some good quality stuff. So if it's a replacement one, make sure it's a good quality replacement or genuine. But I'm always nervous around fuel systems. Mm. That's what affects our life. We do a lot of posts on fuel filters. Sometimes it might become monotonous, but we see it every day. And we've got loads of dirty filters to sort of show it. The proof's in the pudding, isn't it? It is, yeah, that's it. Can you, on the other hand, on the, um, on the flip side, can you do any damage to your engine by over-servicing, by putting a filter in every 5,000 k's? Um, look, I guess with filters it's an interesting one. You, When filters are brand new, and I remember seeing an old test which I've never seen anybody do ever, mm. and that would probably have been 25 years ago by an ag group called the Condonent Group. I don't even know whether you could find this test because it was online. It was with a good old glass bowl 
you know, the two, 296 uh, yep. filter yep. and all the copies of that. Mm. I mean, Delphi own it now. But when it was COV and Lucas, and they did the test and it sort of came out in the end, besides which filter was better than the others, actually initially during that testing, a clean filter might not have been filtering as good as when it started to get into its service. Yeah. You can imagine you're getting a bit of contaminant now helping mm -hmm. lock it up, mm -hmm. reduces flow a bit, but actually starts to filter slightly mm. better. And then you got to the point where it filtered really good, but it reduced flow. Yeah, yeah. Best filter is a filter that doesn't let fuel through, of course, but mm. nothing comes through. Yep. So maybe every five or so, could it be over? Maybe, but that 10 or 20 range gives you a good uh, ability to keep an eye on your fuel. Sure, okay. Um, Michael Lyons writes, I've got a 2005 three litre patrol with a direct injection motor. I'd like more towing powder. P power. Not, I don't know if you can get towing powder. <laughs> it might be good if you could. Sort out the back, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> um, what would I need to do to achieve this? Now, you got caught me off guard there, though, with all that I'll go, again. I'll go again, yeah, so we'll put the powder <laughs> I aside. I wasn't listening to you, that's why the powder got me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, so Michael has a 2005 three litre patrol with a direct injection motor. Uh, uh, yep. He'd like a bit more towing power. Yeah. Um, what can he do to achieve that? Well, pretty much with the patrols, they do run high EGTs. We've seen it with ours. We've seen it with the older non-common rail ones. Um, what would you do straight up? Yes, you can do big mods like the intercoolers, but certainly the exhaust gets rid of the gases a bit easier. It makes a nominal power gain. Um, sometimes with the older ones, also air mass sensors and other things may be a little bit out. So they are a little bit of a problem child vehicle when you're doing mods. Be careful when you do do them. An exhaust mod can open up some other issues with other sensors that are a bit out. Um, straight up, there's no real magic to gaining more power. If it's towing power, don't run 35s or 33s, you know. Keep some of those things down to standard yep. size. There's already a power gain, particularly in torque. Um, obviously a chip, I mean we do a lot of DP chips in those things. And that obviously tunes the injection system mm. with fuel mapping change, of course you've got more power again. But again, they're a hottish running motor, exhaust or exhaust and chip, they're two good mods. The big intercoolers can be great, but they are a pretty big mod, cutting mm. holes in bonnets and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, if anything, of course, you can get good replacement size ones yep. that have fans on them, mm -hmm. but intercoolers that are top mounted must be, as far as I'm concerned, fan cooled. Sure. Because with that big core, now if we stood it upright and it's mm. that big, and then we laid it down flat and we're trying to get through a little groove and that's mm. a big wide groove I'm showing there, not like a little Hilux yeah, one. Yeah. You're actually not going to have a lot of airspeed going in. So intercoolers at a top mount, definitely a fan, okay. everything sort of assists. Yep, okay, very, very interesting. Okay, so uh, Rafa asks, how often do you recommend to check and replace fuel injectors and glow plugs? Now I'm actually going to throw another element to that question, yeah. ask about older mechanical stuff and then also ask that same question with newer common rail stuff. All right, so if this you know, this guy comes in with this old Land Cruiser, Hilux, any of those old ones, we're going to do uh, a fuel injection service. We usually say when they're even new, you know, nearly any time from new because mass production, pressure's dropped, spray patterns dropped off. Once they were done, another 100, 120,000, and when you pulled them out, they were only just coming off colour. Mm. They're actually still going good. So if they haven't been done before, any time from 100 odd thousand Ks onwards. Yep. Glow plugs, really, how long's a piece of string? They can last for a decade mm. in a vehicle, years and years and years and years, mm. probably when you're getting the injectors tested mm -hmm. or if you do live in very cold climate, get an auto, auto electrician to just check them every yeah, now yeah. and then, yep. maybe every 50,000, maybe if you lived in Threadbo, after every season mm. because they're going to be doing a lot of glowing. And they're obviously, they have a specific range, uh, resistance range I guess that they should be. What it comes down yeah. to, they just measure the resistance yeah. and um, if you're really stuck, sometimes they're finding with some of the poorer quality ones, they test okay. Mm. And again, so there's a replacement parts. Got to be a little bit careful. Still a bit hard to start. We pull it out and just go direct battery with two leads. Mm -hmm. And if you compare a new one, in a few seconds it's glowing red yeah. on the end. So be careful. Yeah. You're going to do it at home. But if you test some of the cheap ones, mm -hmm. you put it on, six, seven, eight seconds, we're just starting to mm. glow red. So quite delayed. And that sort of works in with uh, a lot of the older vehicles have a glow light on the dash. Yeah. You'll see when it's in good nick, it might be on for about two or three seconds. Then when they start to get a bit tired, you know, eight, ten seconds. Seems to take like a, a long, long time. time. Yeah. That's right, yeah. exactly. So injectors servicing maybe every 100, yep. 120,000 or so, yeah. and the glow plugs, a little bit depending on the condition. So that's yeah. the old ones. Okay. 
So what about the new common rail motors? So with common rail, again, you're running very high pressure fuel into the injectors. It doesn't mean the injectors are opening at, um, you know, 25, 30,000 PSI. Mm. They're still pretty much a traditional injector body. But when the fuel comes in, it's at very, very high pressure. So it's very precision, precision control. Sure. Now, we're seeing anything with, let's say, a bit of good luck, changing your filters regularly because at high pressure, you can really say keep things clean. Um, anywhere up to a good couple of hundred thousand Ks. Some are coming in 300,000 or so, mm. still actually running quite okay. Mm. Preventative maintenance on the troubled child, maybe the D4D Hilux yeah. Prado, to prevent having to go, what about the noise? Could it be this? Could it be mm. that? Something I've got a hole in a piston. I say about every you know, 100 to 150,000. Yeah. It's not a cheap repair, mm. but in the overall big picture, it's not bad. But generally, common rail, a good few hundred thousand kilometres yeah. easily. We find, unless somehow you have gotten bad fuel, or you know, there's a lot of luck into it really, mm, mm. but bad fuel, don't get cheap fuel. Help yourself from the beginning, getting a known brand fuel, changing filters and everything good leads on from there. Okay, very good. Um, you know what, I'm gonna ask one of my own questions next. Uh, it's got to do with the 200 series sitting behind me. Now this has uh -huh. come in today. Uh, this has come in, it's had some uh, petrol accidentally put into the diesel tank. So the big question is, what happens when uh, when you accidentally fill a tank with petrol, uh, a diesel tank with petrol? Mm. How, how damaging is it? Look, we're seeing more and more and more of it. Um, I, I know this guy just lives locally, mm. and he rang up and obviously said, Andrew, we've driven up the road and, and done a bit of driving, and I've suddenly realised I put petrol in it. What do I do? Well, I said, well, the first thing is stop, turn the mm. motor off. Secondly, how much did you put in? So it's a Land Cruiser, they've got 100 odd litres standard, 120, 140, I can't remember exactly you put a lot of fuel yeah. in it. So you might have put 60, 80 litres or more of fuel in it, mm. petrol, and mm. driven off. That's okay. I mean, you've got diesel in there, so you've got some lubrication. But I, I really say, and we're seeing it more and more and more, uh, you've got a petrol car in the family, mm. you've just gotten into a, you know, into a four-wheel drive now. Yeah. We all know they're becoming popular. It's a yeah. craze, four-wheel drives, SUVs. Probably even more the luxury ones are prone to being owned by somebody that hasn't had a four-wheel drive sure, before. Yeah. So they get that and they're not used to it. You go to the Bowsers, here's your high octane, unleaded everything, all together. No big warning signs, nothing really. I know it's the onus on the owner, but sometimes like anything, you know, you just don't always look. Yeah. Grabs it, puts it in, mm. may not even smell it going in there, all of a sudden you've got petrol in it. What do I do? I think common rail is very, very survivable. This is my view of the world. This thing survived, no problems at all, and we've seen so many over the years. We've had customers, we're 100 odd K south of Sydney, that have driven down here to get some work done, and when we change the fuel filter, as soon as you pull the fuel on off, there's petrol in there. What have we done? Better ring the guy up, you know, you got petrol in. Oh, I filled up a couple of days ago. So he's not only done his work wow. trips, he's driven to us. Yeah. I filled up at Liverpool before I got here, 70, 80 Ks ago, yeah. and did the freeway. I don't think I would be hearing these stories of survival back in the days, you know, 20, 30 years ago with rotary pumps mm. and that sort of stuff, yeah. in the 80s, in the Hiluxes and in those things. With common rail, so many petrol in diesel uh, issues we've seen, and I just don't know of the ones that haven't survived, mm. but pretty much all survived. Mm. I'm amazed. Um, I just say there's not many moving parts. Mm. You've got the injector, a needle lifts up. Mm. You've got the common rail pump with moving parts. Very simple plunger type or a radial vein type, that's it. Mm. There's no complicated injector pump like it was years ago where you had everything in the injector pump, timer mechanisms, governors, everything, all lubricated by the diesel. Mm. And if you had no lubrication because of putting petrol in, snap pump shafts, yeah. everything. So I really say there's a very, very big survivability chance, but you've got to do the right thing. As soon as you know, stop. Mm. Get that fuel out of it. Yep. Uh, do like we've done, drained all the fuel out of it, yep. put about 60 litres of fresh diesel. We drop some of our rattle stop in, which is like a special diesel lubricant sure. for some of these rattling injectors, yep. but we know it's going to help out in this case. Mm. Got him up and running and done. Hmm. So that's all we can suggest. You know, look, honestly, even myself, if I made the big boo boo mistake in a vehicle that had, say, uh, a 70, 80 litre tank, and I've just gone like a lot of customers do. Mm and they're just going, hey, petrol, and they stop. Mm. They put in four or five litres. Yes. I could probably say, don't even worry about it. Fill because it at the end of the day, fill it up. With diesel, Guys, obviously. Exactly, yeah, with probably, diesel. Probably so don't. you make sure you've got a full tank yeah. of diesel. Um, 
look, we've seen that so often mm. and people have done that and they've had no issues. So common rail diesel is very, very survivable. Doesn't mean you can run it on petrol. <laughs> Be very, very careful though. Mm. If you do mix it, the best thing is to drain it out, of course, always. But don't go thinking, geez, I'm up for 12 grand, yeah. 15 grand repairs. The insurance companies pay it. A lot of diesel shops go, thank God, we've mm. got plenty of work going on with petrol and diesel. But at the end of the day, realistically, a lot of people get caught with the bill and it's big. Mm. So think twice about it and get somebody that's going to take the chance like us and flush things out, get it going and, and give it a go. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Because it would be a very scary moment, wouldn't it? Oh, I mean, with the V8s, yeah. it's a big job. You know, eight injectors, common mm. rail pump and all that stuff. You're probably talking with labour and parts, you know, 10, 12, yeah. 14 grand. Crazy figures mm. at the end of the day. And, and probably for nothing. Yeah, yeah well... Well, I reckon that might just bring us to the end of our half hour. I think that's about all that we've got time for for this uh, this round of Forward of Action Live Ask the Experts. Thanks very much for uh, tuning in. If you did miss this, if you tuned in a bit late, don't sweat. We'll be uh, putting this up uh, probably tomorrow on our uh, Forward of Action uh, YouTube channel. Now, just to finish things off, Andrew's got a little surprise, a little gift for everyone watching at home, mate. You've organised a bit of a special deal, haven't you? Yeah, thanks, guys, for coming down. I appreciate it. I love, even at this hour of the night, sitting there <laughs> talking everything that we love, which is diesel. So, yeah, look, if people go to our website at um, berrimadiesel.com, so www.berrimadiesel.com, and if you put in a promo code once you've done your shopping on there, the word Berrima, B-E-R-R-I-M-A, in the promo code section, we'll run that for 48 hours, and that's 10% off the shop. Wide. We've got a couple of bundle packages in there, yep. which are already discounted, yep. which won't be covered. Sure. But if you're buying a catch can or yeah. a filter or just an exhaust by itself or a DP chip or whatever, you'll get that discount if you put in the word <laughs> Berrima into the promo code area. That's awesome. I might just go get my wallet and get onto it now. <laughs> you better hurry up. Mate, thank you very much, Andrew. Always a pleasure, mate. Good, Renan. Thanks. Cheers. I look forward to it again. Will do. Thank you. Thanks, sir.